Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you. This is part 4 of my tips and tricks series, where I just share random tips to make your time in World of Warcraft a little easier, and also stuff that isn't really useful, like exploration, but I think it's still cool, so I'll share it anyways. I usually do these in groups of 20, but since these are a little more lengthy, I just decided to go for 10 in this one, or else the video would be 40 minutes long, so hopefully you don't mind that. First up though, we have a time walking tip. These pop up every few weeks. Basically, you can queue up for dungeons of past expansions, and your character is scaled down to the appropriate level, even including your gear. Something you can do to take advantage of this is to use your old legendaries. These do lose power at maximum levels. Either their stats are too low, or they just flat out have their affixes disabled. But since the gear is scaled back in these dungeons, it's free game. The Legion Legendaries, Shadowmorn, Warglaives, it just needs to be a time walking event at or below that Legendary's level. For example, you can use Glaives with the Burning Crusade time walking no problem, but they'll still be 10 levels too low for the Wrath of the Lich King. And at the same time, you can use Shadowmorn for both Wrath and the Burning Crusade. So, pick them up from the bank, dust them off, and maybe even throw on an expansion level enchant and have at it. If you're going to be farming the glaives, you'll need a fast way to get to the Black Temple. There's an item called the Fractured Necrolite Skull, which when used on a target critter, it consumes its soul and summons a portal directly to the Black Temple in the Outland. This itself is extremely useful, but there may be times where you're not near any critters. Well, look no further because we have the Wombo Combo here. If you have another toy called the Critter Hand Cannon, you can have critters on demand. Simply fire it, and then bust out the skull for access to the Eastern Outlands at any time, anywhere. You get the skull from Kupri, who's the vendor for the Burning Crusade time walking, and the Critter Hand Cannon from a quest in High Mountain in the Broken Isles. I'll have them linked in the description if you want details. And next, we have another trial character tip. As you know, you can create high level trial characters if you want to test out a class near the end game without having to level it. That itself is nice to know, but these really come into play with all of the faction specific stuff. There are a lot of toys and transmogs and so on that only the Alliance or only the Horde can get, so instead of leveling one of each faction just to collect those, you can simply make a trial character and then farm a little gold and just buy them. One of these items you can get is the whole body shrinker from the Ravika vendor, which leads me into my next tip. Well, the first part is as of patch 8.0, the Alliance can actually buy this. It used to be a horde only item, but in 8.0, she now sells to the Alliance as well. You just have to dodge her guards, pretty much. She's located right here in the Echo Isles in Duratar, and you can buy a few things from her, including a transmog that gives you bare feet, but the most useful one is the whole body shrinker. When used, this shrinks you to a pint size and also decreases your damage dealt. There are a lot of old dungeon and raid achievements that require you to get the bosses down to a certain HP level, and they're always a pain because you have to strip naked or get resurrection sickness or whatever, but this makes it much easier because you just use it, whittle them down, and then do your achievement and then simply click off the buff when you're finished. I must have for any toy collector or achievement hunter. In these videos, I always like to include at least one exploration segment. I actually just mentioned this very briefly in the direct previous video, but I thought it was worth a full tour here. And I know this is all over YouTube, but hey, here's my tour with commentary. What you're looking at is the pre-release version of Ironforge prior to patch 0.7. It used to have a much more complex layout, including multiple levels, and a bunch of random nooks and crannies. Starting from the entrance here, the first thing you'll notice is that there's no Magni statue to welcome you to the city. Ironforge was the first city that I walked into in the game, and this was quite the sight to behold. Entering though, you notice quite a smaller front square than what you're used to. No auction house, nor bank. Just a big hallway of various buildings, which would hold vendors for weapons and armor, profession trainers, and so on. Unfortunately, there aren't any NPCs in the version that I'm showing you. 
but taking a right still takes you to the military quarter, but you'll notice that it is quite a bit different. We have another level here actually, and you can go up these set of ramps, and to the right will be that war planning room, where the battle masters would eventually stay. And here, you'd find the hunter and warrior trainers, just like in the current one. It's the same room, just at a higher level. Another weird thing here though, is the game had a mechanic where if you fell from a great height, you'd get a knockdown stun. As you can see, it's a work in progress as my poor dwarf here contorts himself and breaks every bone in his body. But no harm done. Following the same circle, you'd normally expect to find Tinkertown, but instead, it's just another tight hallway with tons of buildings on both sides. A lot of these would be empty because there are just so many. Going forward though, we reach the Hall of Explorers where all of the archivists and archaeologists resided. The building does look a little different on the outside, and inside you can see it's pretty barren. But nothing too different aside from missing NPCs and objects. What's really interesting though is that when you exit this, to your right is where the flight master would be. This little platform would serve as the landing spot as opposed to the Great Forge in release. Following the ring further down though, we have the absence of the Forlorn Cavern, and instead we find the Hall of Mystics. Same deal here with the military wing. This is up one level, and because of this, you don't have that little pool that you'd always get stuck in if you jumped in. So this is where priests, paladins, and mages would train their spells and whatnot. The inside of the building is pretty much the same. This whole area is just up one level. And continuing further, we return to the main entrance. So that's all of the outer ring complete. We do have an inner ring here as well. From the entrance, heading in a clockwise direction, we see more buildings clustered together, and you're probably starting to see why this was all changed. With no map, and all of these levels, and nooks and crannies, players were getting lost all the time. And at this point, I'd like to stress that there were no hearthstones in the game yet. If you were lost, the only way out was to retrace your steps. But continuing forward, we finally find the Forlorn Cavern. So it exists, it was just located in the inner ring instead. So here, we'd have Warlock and Rogue Trainers. As you can see, there's even some poison brewing on the table in the Rogue Building. Continuing past that though, we just have some more random buildings. If you keep going, you'll eventually find the bank. Probably a smarter design for city defense. I always thought it was a little weird in the release version that the bank is right there in the courtyard. It's convenient for the players, but also for horde raids since they can just get all the gold right there. In this version, it's a little more hidden and tough to get to. Heading even further inside though, we stumble across the Great Forge, and this is wildly different. Back then, as you can see, it used to literally be a giant forge, surrounded by a giant pit of lava that's somehow even more imposing than the retail version. Has anyone ever heard of railings? I have a feeling that this isn't up to code. Just outside here though, we have two mysterious pits of doom, one to the north and one to the east. Dropping down to the eastern pit, you'll see that it leads you to the old Deep Run Tram actually. This goes in two directions. It was originally planned that this would lead to Stormwind and also the gnome capital, Nomergon. The latter ended up being scrapped since it would create a faction imbalance since the Alliance would have more cities than the Horde. So eventually, this just connected to Stormwind instead and they turned Nomergon into a dungeon. You can follow these paths, but they eventually lead to the Endless Void since it wasn't finished yet, obviously. But going back up and dropping down the Northern Hole, we have the Core of Iron Forge, also called Old Iron Forge during Vanilla. We now have full access to this ever since the Cataclysm, but this was one of the holy grails of exploration back then. People would find ways to clip into here, Blizzard would fix it, and they'd find another way. Here you can see the crystallized core of the city, just like in release. You can also follow the winding path down, being careful not to fall off the edge into the giant lava pit. It's also important to note that once you fall down here, there's no way back up. 
And with no hearthstones, you can just imagine how many tickets were made by adventurers getting themselves stuck in this giant maze of a city. I guess you could always just jump into the lava and take the spirit res though. This does eventually lead to a dead end, and that's pretty much it. That's all Old Ironforge has to offer. Quite the confusing place to navigate, and it's easy to see why it was changed. It has its charm though, I think. But this video isn't about just exploring, so let's get to the next tip. The next one I wanted to share is to get the Underlight Angler, and the fastest way to get it. This was an artifact in the Legion expansion that gives you some pretty useful buffs while you have it equipped, including water walking, a stealth while you're fishing, sort of a free stationary stealth for any race as long as you're near water, and also a really fast swim speed buff. It's insanely useful for BFA in particular since there's so much water and we can't fly yet. It should be in everyone's inventory in my opinion because it's really quick to get too. To get it, you need to finish the Bigger Fish to Fry achievement, which requires you to catch all the rare fish around the Broken Isles. To do this, you need to get these rare lures, but since they're not soulbound, you can just buy most of them off of the auction house, with the exception of the Sea Bottom Squid in Ocean Waters, since it has a limited duration. In total, it takes about 2 hours at most I'd say, if you're able to buy everything. And to level it, you just catch the same rare fish with the Underlight Angler equipped. The fastest way i found to do this is to get the rusty queenfish brooch from Asuna and to go to one of these pools in the lake. They never disappear, so it yields the highest catch rate of any rare fish. So that's the quick and dirty explanation for the sake of keeping the length down. If I didn't explain it enough, check the description because I'll have a link to a text guide with everything you need to know. Next, we have an oldie, but a goodie. Don't you hate getting dazed off of your mount? You're heading to your next world quest, you open up your map, and suddenly you're on foot and you have a hundred mobs attacking you? You can avoid this by going into your tank spec if you have one. If you're in this, you're immune to any daze effect, so it's always a smart choice between world quests, or maybe you're just doing some AoE grinding, or herbing, or mining, or whatever. There is another alternative though, and that's the Chauffeured Chopper. You get this from the Heirloom Hoarder achievement, which is just collecting 35 heirlooms. It summons a Chauffeured Mount, usable by any character on your account at any level. So very handy for leveling, but another perk is that since an NPC is driving you around, it also makes it so you can't get dazed off of your mount, so it's a nice option for those without a tank spec. The only trade-off is that it is the slow mount speed, so it's not 100% ideal. It does have its uses though. I've seen people use it in island expeditions to gather mobs, which is pretty clever I think. Next, I have a money saver for you. If you want to skip leveling, you can buy a character boost if you want. Right now, it brings you to level 110, so you can start right off in BFA content, and it costs 60 bucks, which I always thought was pretty ridiculous. If you end up going down that route though, my advice is to just buy another expansion since they come with the free 110 boost anyways. As of this video, you can redeem it on any World of Warcraft license tied to your Blizzard account. You don't have to use it on the brand new license. So with this, you get access to another account, which itself can be useful for recruit a friend rewards, or earning yourself through things if you choose to do the monthly fee. But if not, you get the boost anyways, and the expansion does go on sale every now and then, so especially then, you want to go with this method. Another tip for those who use gold to pay for your subscription using those in-game time tokens, if you want to get a little more out of these, never apply it directly as game time if you plan on playing for a while. And that's because there are game time bundles that you can buy that give you discounts the higher tier you go at 3 and 6 month bundles. It's about a $3 discount for 3 months and a $12 discount for the 6 months. So instead, you want to apply it to your Blizzard balance and then buy these bundles to get the most bang for your buck. The 3 month bundle can be a little iffy since there is sales tax depending on where you live, so make sure that you double check that, but the 6 month bundle should net you some savings, so it's definitely the option if you see yourself playing for quite a while. But that's about it. There's some more tips and tricks for you. 
I hope these made your time in game a little easier. Hopefully it saved you some time and money, or at least you were mildly entertained. Like the video if you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.